Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Late Night Learning. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Palomba. Today we're going to be talking about breaking down academic research. And so breaking down academic research really entails looking at one of those old, dry uh, journal articles and trying to figure out um, what is this academic talking about, why is he studying, what are you studying, and so we're going to try to trace the outline of what an academic article looks like. But before we do that, I do want to state something that has happened in my life that I think is kind of germane to everything I try to do on this channel. This past weekend, unfortunately, my family had to put down our Rottweiler, Zena. Uh, Zena was 12, 12 years old and 7 months. And uh, this episode is absolutely dedicated to her. And, you know, I have wonderful memories of uh, going for walks in the woods with her, uh, having her swim in the local lake, Sparkle Lake in Yorktown, and, you know, her stealing food and nipping at people and being a wrestler and being a thief and stealing people's shoes and, and, and barking and growling and telling people off almost like a rut rut kind of thing. And, you know, I have all these memories because I was able to slow down during points of grad school and during points of my life uh, to make sure that I was having those moments with uh, her. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is that you know, everything is crazy in, in today's environment. Uh, your boss wants you to do more. Your family wants you to do more. It's, it's very difficult living in 2018. And, uh, you know, but I, I do want you to remember that as, as busy as you might be studying or watching these videos or whatever else you're doing, please be mindful of the furry friends that walk in and around your legs. Make sure the next time that you're free on a rainy night or maybe on a cool night to, you know, put your phone away, maybe shut off the television and just go for a walk with your pet or hang out with your pet or make a memory with your pet. It's really important. Experiencing what we do with pets is one of the purest forms of love and one of the purest experiences we get to have as human beings is being able to engage, snuggle, love, play, wrestle, and talk to our pets. On that note, let's move along. So, getting back to initially what we were talking about, what is the point of academic research? For some of you, you might be in college. For some of you, you might be in grad school. And you might be saying to yourself, for the love of God, why are we reading this stuff? The point of academic research is to extend theory. We're really, really curious about theory and how this applies to what we know about the world around us. For instance, we might say to ourselves, well, I continue to watch Big Bang Theory. I don't know why I keep doing this, but I am curious upon why. And we're better than just simply saying, well, you just want to be entertained. It's a funny show. I don't know. I like it. Uh, we can do better than that. And we hopefully can do better than that as academic researchers. So really what we look for with a theory is this idea of explaining a process. And if you go into one of my older videos, I go through theory a little bit more. So I implore you to watch that video before you watch this. It'll probably make a little bit more sense to you. Now, if you have watched a video on theory or understand what theory is, you know that it explains a process. So getting back to our Big Bang example, Let's say I watch Big Bang Theory, and I do, uh, some episodes, not all of them. And so if I am watching the show, a researcher might look at me and say, well, you know, Anthony's watching Big Bang Theory, and he might be doing it for a few reasons. How do we explain why Anthony is doing what he's doing? Well, for one thing, we could apply the uses and gratifications approach, which is known as an approach but for our purposes, we could also think of it as a theory. That's a whole other discussion. But the uses and gratifications approach states that people watch entertainment to learn, uh, to be informed, uh, to be entertained, to pass the time, to avoid being bored, among other things. Certainly, if we applied that, it may very well be that I am trying to pass the time and hoping to uh, be entertained or learn something from the show. But there might be other things that are happening. Another theory might be applied here. Social identity theory. Social identity theory states that 
I might perceive myself to belong to some sort of group. Maybe I see myself as part of somebody. And we do this all the time. One of the first papers I wrote at Syracuse University as a grad student was about Guidoism and how watching the Jersey Shore was a kind of how-to manual on leading a Guido lifestyle. And so from there, if we understand why people are watching the Jersey Shore, if we understand why people are watching uh, the Jersey Shore for certain products, and if we understand why people who gravitate to that show tend to exude a Jersey Shore Guido kind of lifestyle, gym tan laundry, then we're understanding how social identity theory is applied here. And so getting back to that slide, that's the idea here. The idea is that we look at a process, why is somebody doing something, and we have to explain it. And so we apply a theory. Now, as researchers, we're tasked to figure out processes. That's the goal. We're really hoping to figure out and tease out why something is happening and apply the proper theory. This is not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but it leads for very challenging, very meaningful, very difficult research. Let's move to the next slide. So great, theory, who cares? Well, <laughs> in replicating studies and finding similar results and being able to support theories and approaches, we can get a better sense of how the world works. And so it's not enough just to say social identity theory may very well explain why I'm watching the Big Bang Theory. It may also aid us in applying it to other things. Keith, my faithful cameraman and editor, may watch the New York Giants. Might he identify as a New York Giant football player? Maybe. He may also watch other kinds of content and identify with certain characters. Maybe it's Sons of Anarchy. Maybe it's Modern Family. And so from these shows, we learn a lot about the fans that watch him. It could be very well that Keith watches Modern Family because he identifies with Phil Dumphy, and he might not be the only guy. And so from this, we can see how and why people do what they do. And if I am, am connecting with the actors on Big Bang Theory, and if Keith is connecting with the actors on Big Bang Theory, now we have something here. We are organizing these studies around social identity theory. That is another purpose of theory. We want to organize stuff. We love organizing stuff. I am sure we all organize things in our closets, or maybe they're tremendous messes. But nevertheless, as humans, we like organization. And so theory helps us capture this. From here, we can structure studies that anticipate results. If Keith watches Modern Family because he identifies with Phil Dumphy, if I watch The Big Bang Theory because I identify with Leonard, which I kind of do a little bit, then we can start building our understanding of how consumers connect to characters and to shows through this theory. We can refine measurements and we can innovate further study design because we have a sense of what's going on, because we can look back at prior studies that have been published and that have been scrutinized by fellow scholars to say, okay, this has been going on for the last few decades. We've been finding this theory supported in a lot of studies. Let's structure our study in this manner. From this, from these studies, textbooks, consulting, software, books, and other products and services are produced. Many of you may wonder, where do these textbooks come from? Who is writing these textbooks? Where do they get this stuff? Where do they get this information? How do they know anything about people? Who's reading this stuff? Well, believe it or not, a lot of academics spend a grand amount of time reading academic articles, taking notes, putting together lit reviews, putting together profiles of certain theories and variables, all for your very own consumption. I am fortunate enough to be contracted currently to write a video game marketing chapter for a brand new media management textbook that will hopefully come out next year. As such, I am relying on previous studies that have tested previous theories that have been either supported or unsupported. And so my objective is to write together 
a really solid video game marketing chapter that may be used by students, practitioners, and other things moving forward. Let's go to the next slide. An introduction into an academic introduction. So when you are writing an academic article, and this is kind of going to be like a how-to as I'm trying to guide some people out there who may be in grad school, some people who might be saying, my God, I'm a PhD student, how do I wrap my head around this? When you're thinking about formulating an academic journal article, or if you're simply trying to write one, the first thing is, in your first paragraph, you really need to be general to specific. I recently had a publication in March, and it dealt with active emotions management with video games. So Anthony comes home one day, he's having a crappy afternoon, he says to himself, this is terrible. I really had a bad day. Uh, the boss was not pleased with the presentation. We did not get Honda, and now it's raining outside. I'm in a really bad mood, a really bad mood. I need to do something. I have to do something. I hope I do something. And so what winds up happening is, if I'm a video game player, and I am, I might have a library of video game uh, units. And so I have a PlayStation 4 at home. Not that I have the time to play it, but I have a PlayStation 4 at home. And so what I may do is play one of my favorite video games, which is, of course, Madden. And so I might go to the wall and, and pick Madden and say, ah, you know, the last time I played Madden, I decimated the Patriots as the Giants, and I sacked Tom Brady so hard, he had to leave in the second quarter. Thank you, Snacks. Giants fans know who that is. And so for all of those reasons, I might say to myself, I felt really good last time. I'm going to play it again and hopefully have the same experience. And so by doing that, I might actually have more brand loyalty toward Madden. Because like a good friend, Doug, Andrew, Todd, Ronan, any of my friends that I currently have, they make me feel good. And so if a video game can have the same uh, effect that might up my brand loyalty toward the video game itself. And so that was the study that I was trying to look at and that I was successful in publishing. So let's kind of break that down a little bit more by going back to the slide. So as you can see, with the first paragraph, general to specific, I began that article about active emotions management by talking about when was the last time an emotion drove you to entertainment consumption. I started really broad, really broad. And then I had a paragraph about the differences between different kinds of emotions. And then I had a paragraph about video game play and how that and emotions uh, interact with one another. And then, if we go to the second paragraph here, I talked about a gap in the academic literature review. A gap. What is a gap? So a gap is this idea that in the literature, in academic literature, there are gaps of knowledge. Just some things that we don't know. Some things that really aren't studied. Some things that nobody's paid attention to. Some things that may have not even existed. So what do we do? Any academic or industry researcher, for that matter, has to justify why we do what we do. You can't just do a study. It doesn't make sense. When I was in industry and I was servicing HBO, Sesame Street, CNN, uh, among other entertainment brands I worked with, you know, we had to justify why we wanted to do a study and the client has to justify it as well. A client may come to us and justify doing the study, or we may go to an existing client and say, hey, have you thought about doing this study? Have you thought about doing a follow-up to what we found here? We have to have those conversations all the time. It doesn't matter if we're academics or if we're just industry researchers. We have to have those conversations. And so we want to be very mindful of when we're thinking about doing another study. Do we need to? Is the research already available? If CBS wants to do a study and they want to do a study with their CBS app, but they also want to include doing a survey, 
That may not make much sense. Why? Well, with the CBS streaming app that you can download onto your TV or smartphone or tablet or laptop, that's already collecting data. We may or may not need to add a survey with that data. That data is actually collecting actual data. With the survey, remember, we rely on people's perceptions, which are remarkably faulty at best. Um, but nevertheless, for many researchers out there, it's the best that we can do. Only now are we collecting actual data with real verve and energy and organization and foresight. And so when we're thinking about gaps in academic knowledge, we want to think about what's going on here, what's been studied, and what can I do to improve it? How can I be better? How can I help the academic literature stream along? Let's go back to the slide. So with the third paragraph, the final piece of the introduction, the idea is what will this study do for industry? What will this study do for academia? And this is important. You want to be mindful of this. If you're doing a study, you don't want to waste people's time. Why are you doing this study? Who are you benefiting? Are you benefiting anyone? Is this kind of uh, something that's going to help move theory along? What does it give us a better understanding of? Why do we need it? These are questions for you to consider as you are construing an academic research article or as you're trying to understand an academic research article. Think about how the authors have structured their introduction. Let's move along. So with the lit review or literature review, this deals with justifying why we even bother with the study. Why do we even bother doing a study. We have to justify our measurements. We have to justify our theory. We have to justify how we've designed all of this for academic research and why we're doing it. And what studies have informed our thinking? What have we read to know that we're onto something? How do you know when you're onto something? For all of those reasons, this is why we have a lit review. So a lit review, please always use theory or an approach. Yes, there are studies that will get published that don't use theory or approaches. Do not do this, grad students who are listening to this. Avoid this. Because you're really not contributing much. The idea is to organize studies around a central theme that explains the how and why behind a process. If you do not do this, your study may be lost in the ether and netherworlds of academic databases. Moreover, by not incorporating theory and approaches, you know, it really brings into question what we're really looking at. Theory helps us bring focus to studies as well. With academic research, you can expect to have 25 to 40 sources. Does it vary? Of course it does. Are there exceptions? Of course there are. But by and large, a good research study has between 25 to 40 studies. I've even seen 50. Citing multiple studies, you will see this as you are reading an academic article. You will read through an academic article and say to yourself, um, why are they studying Williams or citing Williams 2005, uh, Japlin 2007, and Zaworski 1980? or 2012 for that matter, because it's usually in chronological order by date. For all of those reasons, academics will cite multiple scholars because they want to bolster their argument. They want to demonstrate there's a lot of evidence for thinking this way, or a lot of evidence that supports the theory manifesting in these certain areas or whatever they're trying to justify and talk about. So it's important in academic discourse to think about these things and to reflect upon whether or not we are properly discussing something at, at hand here. Um, is it clear what you're trying to get at? And so if you have done this properly in your lit review, um, then you're able to move on. So let's move on. Variables. As you are talking about variables, it's important to think about how we operationalize variables. And I will get to what that means in a second. But just like the cups of coffee that we are looking at, 
I have counted eight. There may be eight definitions of brand loyalty. There may be eight different ways of looking at how you operationalize or define time. Are you measuring time in hours? What about seconds? What about months? How are you measuring brand loyalty? Is it attitudinal loyalty? As you can see at the bottom, is it the attitude toward the brand itself? Is that how we're defining a variable? Or are we defining brand loyalty by behavioral? Maybe it's just the times, the amount of times you go to purchase a product from a brand. Maybe you go to Express, maybe you go to Gap, and maybe you keep buying clothing from those stores. Up, oh, must be brand loyalty. Maybe you go to Macy's and do the same thing. Maybe you keep buying the same unbranded version of aspirin. Is it still brand loyalty? Maybe. For me, I usually identify brand loyalty as the attitude toward the brand itself. But there are other scholars that define brand loyalty differently. This is where complexity seeps into every, every conversation among academics. So with variables, these are factors that we measure to better understand a process. A theory may explain why and how something occurs, as we noted, while variables explain what is responsible for the occurrence, and sometimes by how much. So the variables will say, okay, we think that social identity theory is happening. How do we want to measure for social identity theory? And what else is contributing or involved with social identity theory? So, if we're looking at variables, as I've said earlier, brand loyalty is a variable. It's not a theory. It is a variable. It is a measurement. It is able to measure some sort of variation in a process. But it must be operationalized. And so we have attitudinal loyalty and behavioral loyalty. Red pill or blue pill, which one do you take? This is part of the burden that an academic will carry with him or herself as they are constructing an article. Let's move along. Operationalize a variable. As we can see, this young lady is so happy to have candy. And she's clearly old enough not to be trick-or-treating, so I suspect this is the best she can do. And so I don't know if she has brand loyalty toward these candies. I don't know. But that's why I've offered the picture here, to make you think. A variable must be operationalized. It must be defined. As there are different variations of a variable, as we've seen. What does it mean for intent to purchase? If that's a variable for you, you mean intent to purchase in the next week, year? What do you mean intend by? Are they going to the store? Or is it just the desire they have? You have to define this as the researcher. There's also attitudinal loyal and behavioral loyalty again that have manifested here. The idea of defining our variables will never go away. Something to be mindful of when you're talking to people. Let's move along. Theory and approaches. As we've said earlier, theory is meant to highlight how and why something happens. An approach possesses less rigor than a theory, as it does not take as much risk as a theory does. So, I mentioned earlier uses and gratifications. Uses and gratifications says that people use media for certain gratifications, certain anticipated gratifications. The audience is aware. They are deliberate. They purposely select certain kinds of media. Fine. But isn't that always the way? Don't we kind of always use media for that? We use it for a use. Some sort of anticipated gratification we hope to obtain will come. Is that really risk taking? Probably not. And so the uses and gratifications approach has been called an approach because it does not take as much risk. In other words, it will always be supported. A uses and gratifications approach will likely always be supported in a media study 
because by and large people do use media for certain uses and have certain anticipated gratifications. I don't know of a study that has found uses and gratifications to not be supported. Although I'm sure there may be some, it's probably generally not the case. Not much risk is taking there, is it? Or is there? And so uses and gratifications is relegated to being nothing more uh, than a simple approach. Let's go back to the slide. And so achieving and maintaining psychological well-being differently may not manifest in each media consumption process. This refers to self-determination theory, the idea that we need to be competent, the idea that we need autonomy, and the, the idea that we need relatedness in social media or in media consumption for that matter. And so to achieve internal psychological well-being, I might say to myself, or I might wind up making a selection for happy music to feel better. And so I'm competent in making the media consumption decision. I am autonomous because I'm the only one who's making this decision. And finally, there's relatedness. We like to share our media consumption experiences with other people. And so when you're thinking about how to apply theory, how to apply um, the how-to with a particular process, this is how I'd like you to start thinking about uh, organizing and understanding how an academic article is formulated. Well, that's all the time we have on Late Night Learning. As always, keep laughing and keep learning.